So the first the first uh, speaker this morning is Jonathan Scott Lee. He teaches philosophy at uh, Colorado College in Colorado Springs. Uh, he writes that we're, he's working at the intersection of archaic Greek philosophy, late 20th century European philosophy, and psychoanalytic theory. He writes about uh, and is published on John Cage, Pierre Boulez, Yanis Zanakis, Cecil Taylor, AMM, Jackson Macklow, uh, Justin Dosel, Chelsea, yeah. Stefan Mallarmé, Antoine Artaud, and uh, more and more Spike Lee. Crazy. Great, all the, <laughs> all the, the players. Uh, so the, he's also the author of the book, uh, book on Jacques Lacan, and Lee also writes music for small ensembles and is currently engaged in a book uh, length book like essay on the video and cinema work of Jean-Luc Godard as a form of philosophical insurgency. Okay, go ahead, jump in. Thanks. I want to thank you all for coming this morning, and I want to thank Mark and um, Eldridge for uh, putting this amazing conference together. I was, I've been telling many of you as I've talked with you in the course of the day yesterday, that were I to go to a normal philosophy conference, I would probably find at most about 12 minutes of the proceedings interesting. And the rest are just absolutely. Where'd you go? <laughs> it's, it's that bad, yes, Geraldine knows. Um, and I was just continu continuously stimulated yesterday by um, what was happening in this room, the things that are were being talked about, the beauty of some of the presentations, the profundity of others. Uh, just really kind of an amazing, amazing uh, day. Long day, but amazing day. Um, I come to this sort of material, obviously, from, from way, way back, in a sense, child of the 60s. Uh, my first intellectual hero was John Cage. Um, but only recently have I begun to sort of try to make sense of the so-called speculative uh, realist world. And I'm not sure I do make sense of it, but this is my attempt uh, coming from a rather traditional philosophical background, trained as an analytic philosopher, became uh, Lacanian, sort of. Um, but um, trying to make sense of some of this uh, in something like my own terms. Um, so uh, this is my, maybe, maybe speculative realism 101. Uh, but. So it's called an experimental analytic of the beautiful real. In the last essay he wrote, Gilles Deleuze opens up the possibility of a radically imminent approach to philosophical research. What is a transcendental field, he asks. Quote, it can be distinguished from experience in that it doesn't refer to an object or belong to a subject, empirical representation. It appears, therefore, as a pure stream of asubjective consciousness a pre-reflexive impersonal consciousness, a qualitative duration of consciousness without a self. It may seem curious that the transcendental be defined by such immediate givens. We will speak of a transcendental empiricism in contrast to everything that makes up the world of the subject and the object." Unquote. That's, of course, from the essay called Imminence, the Life. Characterizing both the subject and object as transcendent, Deleuze goes on to insist, quote, the transcendent is not the transcendental. Good Kantian point, right? Were it not for consciousness, the transcendental field would be defined as a pure plane of imminence because it eludes all transcendence of the subject and of the object. Absolute imminence is in itself. It is not in something to something. It does not depend on an object or belong to a subject." Unquote. That there might be ways to construe philosophical work otherwise than is rooted in the human subject, otherwise than is transcendent to the field of its object, otherwise than is obsessed with symbolic systems distanced from the real, these are the stakes of the wager that Deleuze makes in this provocative text. Perhaps nowhere might the possibility of a radically imminent philosophical work seem more unlikely than in aesthetics, a domain dominated since the 18th century by delicately nuanced accounts of the subjective responses of individual critics and connoisseurs to objects deemed works of art. My goal here is to explore how a radically imminent aesthetics of sound art, in particular, might be developed. For the sake of a brief exposition, I will work in a pretty traditionally linear manner, although I actually think of this project as something like a mobile constellation 
the elements of which are Alvin Lussier's Music on a Long Thin Wire, which we were listening to as we began the day today, from 1977, and texts of François Laruelle, Emmanuel Kant, and Jacques Lacan, all floating in some relation to Deleuze's transcendental empiricism. In the best of all possible worlds, as I sort of read this talk to you, we just have Lucier in the background. But I think in terms of balance and attention and whatever, it's probably not a good idea. But, but you understand the, my longing for that. Alvin Lucier describes the construction of music on a long, thin wire as follows, quote, the wire, so I'm trying to imagine this, the wire is extended across a large room, clamped to tables at both ends. The ends of the wire are connected to the loudspeaker terminals of a power amplifier placed under one of the tables. A sine wave oscillator is connected to the amplifier. A magnet straddles the wire at one end. Wooden bridges are inserted under the wire at both ends, to which contact microphones are embedded, routed to a stereo sound system. The microphones pick up the vibrations that the wire imparts to the bridges and are sent through the playback system. Initially, this construction, as he calls it, was played as an instrument by Lucier and David Rosenboom. But in the end, Lucier decided to, quote, create a system that would play itself. And this is what it's doing. I'm not touching a thing here, unquote. Seeing himself as interested in what he calls the poetry of what we used to think of as science, Lucier writes, quote, I seem to be a phenomenologist in some ways. I would rather discover new sound situations that invent new ways to put material together." Unquote. Essential to the working of music on a long, thin wire is its environment and not its creator. Quote, since the wire is so long, it makes wonderful sounds, but more important, they change all the time. Because the wire is slack, it's not under tension the way piano strings are. Footsteps, temperature changes, air currents also cause the wire to change. It's a fragile system. I trust you all notice that in, in the opening audition of this, that what sounded sometimes like just a sine wave turns into something else. But th there's no manipulation, it's just happening. With Lucier's work then, I think we are completely in a Deleuzean plane of imminence, where any attempt to use the piece as a means of stepping outside the piece effectively folds the attempted transcendence back into the eminence of the piece. I think what we see here is something analogous to what Francois Laruelle sees in his non-standard aesthetics, for example, in his book on uh, non-photography. Non Writing of an insurrectional aesthetics, Laruelle envisions a kind of discourse in which, quote, ecstatic depth itself is overridden like the relief on a photo, unquote. Imminence, in effect, always reclaiming its other. The optimal philosophical or critical text, working some sort of discursive parallel to Lucier's sound art, would function concurrently with the sound itself, the subject of the statement resonating with the subject of the enunciation. That's why I wish we were listening to Lucier right now. Laruelle provocatively goes on to characterize aesthetic insurrection of this sort as, quote, the generic extension of Kantian aesthetics, unquote, and insists somewhat enigmatically that, quote, one must carry on and radicalize the Kantian subtraction of aesthetics, ripping away the without from the absolute in order to conceive it as radical, unquote. At the risk of normalizing the enigmatic, I think that's what philosophers often do, I want to turn now to the analytic of the beautiful in Immanuel Kant's critique of judgment from 1790 and sketch a detournement of his analysis of the four moments of the judgment of taste. And to be honest, this is a very mild detournement. I'm not truly a Debordian situationist, um, although there's a part of me that wishes I were. So that what I'm doing here is doing as simple a detournement as possible as Debord says in his user's guide to détournement, the best détournements uh, are so simple that the unconscious response of the reader or the audience uh, overwhelms the, what you've done. <clears throat> 
Where Kant sees himself as characterizing the transcendental paradoxes of aesthetic subjectivity revealed in our experience of beauty, I will systematically transform these paradoxes into an imminent analysis of what I call the beautiful real. The fundamental premise of Kant's entire account is that when someone claims that something is beautiful, the determining ground of this judgment, quote, cannot be other than subjective, unquote, so that beauty is roughly comparable to a feeling of pleasure or displeasure, something that exists only in a subject and not in an object, even if we call such an object pleasing. This is old hat. I know this is all totally familiar. Crucial to Kant's account is that the pleasure of aesthetic beauty is a pure, disinterested delight, so that, quote, taste in the beautiful may be said to be the one and only disinterested and free delight, for with it no interest, whether of sense or reason, extorts approval, unquote. This is the first moment of Kant's account, and it offers us the paradox of a delight or joy or pleasure that is free and disinterested, a subjective joy apparently floating independently of any fact about the real. To detune this moment, we simply need to see that Kant's claim that what we judge to be beautiful is that which produces a delight without any interest easily becomes a claim about the impossibility of any differential distance between the real and the subject. In our case, between Lussier's sound art and its auditor. In listening to music on a long, thin wire, where does the music end and the listener begin? What sense can we make of either the piece of music or the auditor as transcendent object or subject? We are here in the in itself of absolute imminence, where sound and delight entwine together, free of any causal determination. Do you need to hear a little bit more? Or is that, I mean, of the Lucier, or do you have that, if you had that experience? Let's listen. Okay, we this, my, my talk is short, so he says. <laughs> Again, what sense can we make of either the piece of music or the auditor as transcendent object or subject? Where does the music end and the listener begin? We are here in the in itself of absolute imminence, where sound and delight entwine together, free of any causal determination. Kant's analysis moves from the disinterested character of aesthetic delight and its freedom from extortion to the second moment of the judgment of taste, its universality. Because the quote, subject, the subject feels himself completely free in respect of the liking which he accords to the object, he can find as reason for his delight no personal conditions to which his own subjective self might alone be party. 
Hence, he must regard it as resting on what he may also presuppose in every other person." Unquote. The result of this, according to Kant, is that the judgment that something is beautiful, quote, must involve a claim to validity for all men, and must do so apart from universality attached to objects. That is, there must be coupled with it a claim to subjective universality, unquote. The paradox here is clear. A universality that is only subjective and yet is grounded in nothing unique to any subjectivity is a curious universality, indeed. Yet this paradox, seen in a slightly different light, is really nothing different from what Deleuze describes as the plane of eminence. What we have here is a pure stream of a subjective consciousness, transcendental and thus universal precisely because no self is implicated in its characterization. Even for the auditor roaming the space in which music on a long, thin wire performs itself, an auditor experiencing constantly shifting patterns of overtones, even for him or her, the sound refuses any plausible separation between auditor and source. The sound flows in a consciousness truly a subjective, and nothing here distinguishes my experience from yours. We're surely in the domain of the universal, but the universal has shifted its standing from Kant's subject of subjectivity to the plane of the real. With the third moment of the judgment of taste, Kant shifts his ground in a way that would seem to demand something like a transcendental condition of aesthetic subjectivity. Here the claim that something is beautiful is tied to its apparent purposiveness, even though its finality rests on, quote, its possibility being only explicable and intelligible for us by virtue of an assumption on our part of a fundamental causality according to ends, unquote. What we deem beautiful then, according to Kant, exhibits a purposiveness or finality without there actually being any purpose or end present in it. Kant famously <coughs> says, quote, beauty is the form of finality in an object so far as it is perceived in part in it, I'm sorry, let's try that again. Beauty is the form of finality in an object so far as perceived in it apart from the representation of an end, unquote. The Kantian paradox of purposeless purposiveness, one of the most striking aspects of the subjective encounter with beauty, becomes in our detournement an axiom governing the real's paradoxical non-teleological teleology. Lussier's construction, admittedly the product of human purposive activity, is nevertheless a purely imminent flooding of a subjective consciousness, insistent in its thereness, and yet curiously just there. In any, any auditor's attempt to attribute some sort of purpose to the sound, to transcend the sonic field of eminence, is destined to be reabsorbed in the wash of sound that <coughs> constitutes the real that is the piece. The final logical moment of Kant's analysis involves his insistence that, quote, what we have in mind in the case of the beautiful is a necessary reference on its part to delight, unquote. The necessity present here, however, Kant describes as exemplary, precisely because, quote, it's the necessity of the ascent of all to a judgment regarded as exemplifying a universal rule incapable of formulation." Unquote. The paradox here, of course, lies in the idea of having to assent to a rule that cannot be formulated, of having to submit to a law that cannot be articulated. I don't know about you, but I've always thought Kant is the most amazingly bizarre philosopher. Uh, I, I love him because he's so strange. At this point, it seems to me, detournement of Kant is hardly necessary. His theory has effectively done the work of detournement on itself. Music on a long, thin wire, in its occupation of some fragment of space-time, offers itself as an exemplary occupation of space-time. And there's nothing more to be said or formulated in response to its seductive saturation of the real. Lucier's construction is effectively in itself. As Deleuze says, it is not in something to something. It does not depend on an object or belong to a subject." What we, see in here, what we see and hear 
actually, exemplified in music on a long, thin wire, is then truly an experimental analytic of the beautiful real. In the place of a transcendental analytic of aesthetic judgment of the sort Kant so compellingly outlines, what we find in Lussier's piece is in itself the experimental, experiential manifestation of the plane of eminence that Deleuze evokes. This construction in sound refuses any differential distance between the real of the sound and the real of the listening subject. <clears throat> it constitutes itself in a virtually universal, asubjective consciousness. Its thereness insists with the force of something like purposiveness. And yet its spatiotemporal saturation is exemplary of nothing but itself. In this sense, the beautiful real gives itself, in La Ruelle's words, an ecstatic depth, but a depth immediately folded back into the surface of its own eminence. A work of art, a construction of sound art, like music on a long, thin wire, might well be considered along the lines of the sort of radically imminent aesthetics that I've just derived from Kant. A lingering question nevertheless remains, if subjects and objects emerge, however evanescently, from the transcendental plane of eminence, how might we begin to think of the relation that brings together these evanescent transcendents for the brief encounter that we've grown accustomed to call aesthetic experience? My own suggestion for a path towards an answer to this question takes us to the work of Jacques Lacan and in particular to a seminar of 1969-1970, uh, The Other Side of Psychoanalysis, or as I would prefer to translate it, but nobody asked me, um, The Seamy Side of Psychoanalysis. Here Lacan sketches an account of what he calls the Four Discourses, an account meant to provide a formalized approach to the notion of intersubjectivity, of what he calls the social bond forged by our use of language. This is certainly not the place to try to provide an overview of Lacan's influential and provocative rethinking of the very nature of subjectivity, God no. Um, a rethinking that stresses in a manner as forceful as that of Deleuze the absolute priority of imminence. Nor is this the place to lay out the four discourses, that of <coughs> the master, that of the university, that of the analyst, and that of the hysteric in their algorithmic unity and difference. My own very limited goal here is to provoke with the suggestion that a radically imminent aesthetics might usefully think the work of art in terms of the discourse of the analyst. And I want to say there's a, a lot has been written about the four discourses, um, but so far as I can find, no one has ever talked about works of art as exemplifying the discourse of the analyst. In fact, most of what people are writing about the the discourses, Zizek among them, uh, is thinking about the social and political uh, dimension of them. So this is something, I think, new. In the formalization of Lacanian algebra, the discourse of the analyst takes the following form. So here I'm going to go to the blackboard, because you know I'm actually the generation that doesn't know how to really use electronic media. <laughs> and you're, you're all going to see this very quickly, right? But the, the discourse of the analyst, there's a little A, if it were in print, it would be an italicized A, right here. And there's a line. And under it, there's a capital S with a subscript 2. From the little A, I draw an arrow over here. At the end of the arrow, there's an S with a slash through it. The dollar sign will work. Hmm. There's a bar underneath it, and beneath it, there's an S with a subscript 1. Okay. So, A over S2, arrow, bar S over S1. It's not really very fascinating. <laughs> Simply put, <laughs> what did I say? It becomes very interesting when you start to play with it, is the thing. But what the, uh, simply put, <laughs> What this means is that the analyst in the psychoanalytic relationship takes on the role of the objet petit a, that's the little a, in relation to the analysand. As a piece of trash destined to be thrown away, 
piece of shit meant to be flushed away as an unwanted surplus jouissance. The objet a calls for or interpolates, to use the good Althusserian word, the bard s, the hysterical subject. In acknowledging this call, and that's what the arrow is about, in acknowledging this call, the hysterical subject comes to a realization of the fundamental splitting characteristic of the human condition. The realization that the subject of the statement and the subject of the enunciation cannot be the same, despite the fact that both are characterized by the first person pronoun I. I am never the I of whom I speak, or as Lacan likes to remind us, as Rambeau says, I is an other. It is this realization that sets the hysteric speaking, and psychoanalysis is essentially defined by this intersubjective process set in motion by the confrontation between the analyst and the hysteric, the piece of shit and the split subject. What the hysteric offers through speech is one master signifier after another, and that's what the S1 is, one after another after another. And the chain of these signifiers, S2, emerges as the truth of the analyst's discourse, a truth embodying a knowledge never explicitly spoken as such. Now, if we take the work of sound art, music on a long, thin wire, <laughs> my example, to occupy the position of the analyst, and thereby stand as an impossibly real objet a, then sound art effectively makes of its auditor a split subject. In other words, the work of sound art hystericizes its auditor, and this fact has significant consequences <coughs> for an imminent aesthetics of the medium of sound art. My detournement of the analytic of the beautiful yields an account of the beautiful real as a plane of imminence rippling with pseudo-Kantian paradoxes. Utterly impossible and yet real, the work of art interpolates its auditor into the position of an hysteric destined to try to heal the wound of his or her splitting with ever new signifiers, both vocabularies and syntaxes. The resulting chain of signifiers constitutes a kind of knowledge, but not a knowing of some object. Aesthetic knowing is just another ripple in the plane of imminence, neither transcendent to the work of art nor a mode of transcendence for a subject. Thus, Lussier's sound construction calls upon us to speak. In its paradoxical impossibility, it spurs us on to give it a voice. We give in to this spur with word after word, no one of which can ever do more than rearticulate a sequence of gaps. First, the gap between music on a long, thin wire and me. Second, the gap between me and what I can say about myself. Third, the gap between each individual signifier S1 desperately attempting to master Lucier's drone and the chain of signifiers S2 that constitutes the field of signification as inevitably other than each of its constitutive signifiers. It's the registration of each of these gaps along the plane of imminence of the impossible real that effectively constitutes what we call with a certain nostalgia aesthetic experience. Such is the ultimate bearing of the radically imminent aesthetics that I've tried to sketch. Without needing in any way to transcend the imminence of the work of art, a whole discourse unfolds in resonance with its imminent sound. Such a discourse would effectively exemplify John Cage's oft-repeated aspiration, quote, to find a way of writing which, though coming from ideas, is not about them, or is not about ideas, but produces them. Unquote John. Thank you.